Okay. Hi. Frank Fahey here. It's, uh, boy, I have April 1st. I should know better. It's actually April 29th. Uh, just testing everybody here. Uh, another example of the black swan. But today we're going to talk about uh, looking at risk or rethinking risk. Bates and uh, a subtitle, Black Swans, Trading and Planning for the Improbable. Okay, this is a picture of me. Uh, I started, went down to the CBOE floor in, gosh, 1984, after uh, starting my business career with digital equipment and IBM. I was in Chicago, and I saw that there was a Quite frankly, a real opportunity here in town that we had probably about 6,000, 7,000 pit traders in town at the time. Uh, now there's probably, uh, geez, a quarter of that. There might have been 10,000 traders at the time when you figure everything in. But favorite saying of mine, and I got it from my dad, who got it from Louis Pasteur, which is chance favors the on, only the prepared mind. Now, when my dad used to tell me that, it was you know usually to get me to uh, start studying early for tests or doing research for a paper. I, I thought it was a particularly sage mind. I didn't realize that it was a product of his classic education and perhaps even being a contemporary of Louis Pasteur. Okay, so what is a prepared mind? It's common to high achievers across many high-risk uh, professions. These professions include airline pilots, emergency first responders, um, policemen, traders, emergency room physicians, nurses, and lifeguards. And the, the, the prepared mind is constantly honing and expanding you know, if, for traders, there are options, knowledge base, any knowledge base. And what you need to be able to do is recognize and decipher and act across a complex set of condi conditions. Now, what, the way I do it, one thing that you start getting good at as you uh, gain wisdom and gain experience is you re reduce, I reduce this complexity to a, a set of uh um, lowest common denominators. Now, somebody hears two voices. Does uh, anybody else hear uh, two voices? Or is, do we have somebody that just has a horrible connection? Okay, everybody hears one voice. I would suggest that the person with two voices Resign in. It's probably a bad connection with WebEx, number one. Number two, uh, th there will be a recording of this that you can have later. Okay? So th the important thing, and one thing I always work on, is reducing the complex to the simple. Because, gosh, with the new trading platforms, we're constantly assaulted by information. And it's easy to make a decision based on, you know, the, the wrong piece of information that comes across. And so the, the, the prepared mind will see opportunities where others see risk. So, for example, uh, an example of that outside of trading is uh, Conrad Sullenberger seeing the East River there and landing an airplane in there and uh, with no loss of life. Um, as a trader, we may see certain high implied volatilities that say, hey, uh, you've lost money, but don't exit because it's a, you, you really don't have the risk you think you have. Uh, we'll challenge and test trading sta tr strategies. What if, what if, what if this happens, what if that happens? And uh, it, all this allows me to make what's hopefully a reasoned and informed decision. And, you know, the, the core of this for me is going, what if, what if, what if this happens, what if that happens? And uh, hopefully I'll, I'll, I'll come up with a good solution. Um, gosh, it starts at the very beginning of trading. I can't tell you how many times I'll say to somebody, why did you pick these strike prices and uh, on this strategy? 
and uh, they'll give me a scenario, and, and I'll say, okay, that's fine, but why these strike prices? Well, I modeled it, and it looked good, and I said, well, did you model it, you know, making the difference between the strike prices wider, narrower, sliding the strike prices up and down? And it'll be, no, well, this one looked good. Well, based on my experience, and one thing that I realize is that over time, um, Uh, that over time, it's amazing how often that that first choice is actually will come in number nine out of nine. It's not saying that it's bad, but there were eight better ones. So that's something that you know I I, I have to force myself to do is do the multiple what ifs. It's it's not easy and it, it can be complicated at times, and it runs counter to my ADD personality. Okay, this is a hypothetical performance disclaimer. It's uh, something that FINRA and the SEC uh, require us to do. Uh, all of this, any examples you see, are just for teaching purposes only. Okay, uh, I, I, I teach discipline. I teach trading strategies. I do not teach and will not be teaching a specific entrance point into any specific market right now. Okay? So uh, understand that that's all this is. We're moving forward. Okay, what is a black swan? Uh, I would imagine that uh, a number of us, of you have read the book, The Black Swan. And the black swan is, well, we'll go forward. There was a Roman poet uh, and historian known as Juvental, whose rara avis and terras nigroques similima signo. Okay, hopefully uh, the, the Latin I learned in grade school and uh, junior high and as an altar boy still works. But what it said is a rare bird in the lands, very much like a black swan. And it, by the mid-16th and 17th century in England, it, it, it meant that thing that could not occur because there was a scientific fact that all swans are white. Well, what happened was uh, in 1697, a Dutch explorer discovered Western Australia and as part of his discovery, he discovered black swans. So all of a sudden, uh, the black swan went from being a scientific impossibility to an example of what might be known as a logical fallacy, or uh, prob a logical fallacy would probably be the best description of that. Uh, in the early 2000s, I think 2001, uh, uh, an author by the name of Nassim Nicholas Talib wrote a book called The Black Swan, The Impact of the Highly Improbable. So we went from impossible to improbable. And part of the lesson that we learn there is really nothing is impossible. It's as improbable as it may be, it doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Now, this is a great book. Uh, I enjoy it. Um, personally, my favorite chapter is Chapter 15. It, you could get by just reading one chapter here. Chapter 15 is really quite good, and I, I will always digress. It's about the, um, the Gaussian curve, or what we call the normal distribution. Very interesting. Okay. Now, back to the book, The Black Swan. Every library should have it, so feel free to check it out. If they do not have it, ask your librarian to order it for you. Um, librarians have to order a lot of books, and they, they really appreciate the assistance from uh, people with more expertise than they have. Uh, we have more expertise on options, and uh, I found that uh, – my librarian is generally more than happy to uh, order any 
finance or options book that I might recommend. So before you buy a book, check it out and uh, at your library and see if they have it. See if they'll order it for you. And uh, it's a good way to learn. Okay? So, so what's a black swan event? Okay? It lies outside of the realm of uh, regular expectations. And what's a regular expectations? For me, that would mean, yeah, that could happen. That might happen. You know, but it, it's something that I would expect to happen. And uh, it happens to us all the time uh, as we trade because we base our decision on what we have seen, what we have experienced. Now, trust me, after nearly 30 years of trading options and uh, well over 20 in the pits, I not, I'm not too surprised by uh, uh, very many uh, black swans. And generally, for it to be truly uh, a black swan, it needs to carry an extreme impact. And these are uh, Talib's definitions of the black swan. His definition of a black swan event has become come to be the standard for uh, our industry, the financial industry, which is where he came from. Okay. And uh, the third characteristic of a black swan event is that human nature makes us concoct explanations for its occurrence after the fact, making it explainable and predictable. Okay, so uh, it's always, why did this happen? And then it's the next thing is, how can we keep it from happening? And the next step generally appears to be, how can we legislate, what can we legislate to prevent it from happening? Um, it... Uh, it, 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 it's interesting what happens when we have black swans, um, definitely. Now, here are some black swan events, and this is just in my 30 years of trading. Numerous weather events, and gosh, we can start with hurricanes. We've had uh, rain events, which have shut down power. We have Ice storms that have shut down power in the whole Midwest. I remember last summer I was looking at something, and I had run through a year where I had had 13 weather events that prevented me from accessing uh, the markets from my home, either via the Internet or the uh, due to electricity because then my wireless routers don't work, the, the modems don't work, in a year and a half, including five and ten weeks. Okay. Now, I'll put something, I have added something to this that's my basic checklist for dealing with weather events and something that I have to do all the time. It's an ongoing thing. I had an Internet service outage, which, interestingly enough, only affected Comcast I'm on the Comcast network. It affected Comcast.net, but there was a workaround that you could get using Comcast.com. Now, my geek son somehow figured that out. Many thanks to him. I shouldn't call him a geek. He's a great kid, but he knows his computers. But that's one of those things is I have alternate places to go to. You know, what do I do? Uh, you know, I, I have to do something. I, I go to the colleges around me, libraries around me. Nice thing about colleges is college libraries are generally open 20, 24 hours a day. And uh, many of us have reached that age where we can be senior adjunct uh, members. So uh, I have library passes to four colleges around me. Computer and software problems, gosh, you know, it, how many of us have updated our trading platform or uh, just had a glitch on our computer that can, uh, prevents us from being able to trade? Okay, and these are things that I have experienced, which are black swan events. Okay, and by the way, feel free to interrupt me at 
any time. I'll try and answer uh, the questions you may have. Um, and, and while I'm thinking of it, May 11th, I will be speaking on the behalf of the Boston Options Exchange in Schaumburg at the Options Industry Council Education Day. So that'll be May 11th in Schaumburg, Illinois, and I believe that's at, oh, I, I don't know where it is. Go to the options, optionseducation.org, and they'll tell you. In addition, I will be in Kansas City May uh, 16th. Excuse me, May 15th and 16th. I'll be teaching two courses there on behalf of the BATS Exchange. You can register for that on uh, optionseducation.org. I'm doing that, once again, uh, education for the Options Industry Council. Anybody that can make it, I would love to uh, meet you, and I'd even let you buy me a beer. But uh, So we'll go back. I was there for the... Black Swan events that have, gosh, affected me directly. The 1987 stock market crash, Black Monday. Actually, Tuesday was far scarier. I mean, that was totally outside of my realm of understanding. I was basically as prepared for that as I would have been for an alien landing on LaSalle Street. I was a newer trader and really did not understand the implications of something like this. Now, I did not have the tools that you have now. Uh, in fact, the tools we have available available to us through Option View and our trading platforms exceed anything I had through my time on the trading floors. And I, I was on a trading on a floor through uh, 19, 19, 2006. So I was down there, gosh, 23 years trading in the pits, and I never had anything like option view. Okay, I false Emulex earning warnings. I traded a stock once called Emulex that uh, opened the day at 108. Fake earnings came across on Bloomberg. It sold off down to a low of 38. Okay, I was short. 30, 75 puts, which I could have bought for a nickel. Keep this in mind. So I I sold 3,000 shares of Emulex at 75. I was long about 160 puts. At, uh, as the stock was going down, I went in to buy uh, 7,000 shares, okay, at, with a 60 top. It traded as low as 38. I never got filled. It stopped for a while. They determined it was a false uh, earnings warning. The stock reopened at 138 and closed the day at 108. Now, I didn't do anything at 108 or 138. I was probably shell shocked. I ended up the day down 100,000 bucks on something that I could have covered for $150. Um, I learned a number of things there. Number one, I don't let short options sit around anymore. I pay the nickel. Uh, that's a very important thing to learn. But it's also a black swan because why didn't I cover it for a nickel? Ah, uh, this will never happen. I was trading Rockwell when the space shuttle Challenger exploded. I mean, the last thing you expected was that. Okay? Uh it was localized enough that I actually knew how to re react, which was to buy puts immediately. I mean, it happened on TV in front of me. And, you know, I knew what my position was. Uh, the flooding of the utility tunnels in Chicago. Sh Chicago is uh, over a honeycomb of tunnels, which uh, had uh, utility wires run through, cable runs through, power runs through. Uh, fiber optic runs through, but they were originally built to uh, transport goods between buildings. They were uh, they transmitted. Uh, they had pneumatic tubes which sent messages from one building to another, and there was a, a narrow gauge railroad down there which delivered coal, took out trash. It was quite a thing. Well, it flooded, in, and uh, shut down the loop and shut down the exchanges. And, and what do you do? Now, this was a, a, quite the problem because when this happened, 
options were single listed. They were not on eight exchanges. Okay. Uh, September 11th. Gosh, I, I couldn't trade for a week. I remember uh, driving downtown and hearing this happen, driving to the loop, and, you know, never could trade. We had the flash crash, the fat finger. Uh, these things are never ending, okay? Um, and I'll come back and we'll say, okay, fine, how do you deal with these things? What did you learn, Frank? Uh, how do you approach it so it doesn't happen? Oh, well, it does happen so that I can mitigate the pain. The earthquake and tsunami in Japan was an, a, affected the markets amazingly. We had, I remember the moment they said, hey, it looks like there might be a meltdown. All of a sudden, we had a, a, a huge downward movement in the uh, markets and a massive explo uh, explosion is the correct term in implied volatility. Gulf oil spill. If you were trading, gosh, any of the oil uh, uh, rig suppliers or oil suppliers like uh, Schlumberger, Transocean, or the oil companies, uh, British Petroleum, and actually anybody that had any uh, uh, presence in the uh, the Gulf from a drilling standpoint or from a supplying standpoint, they, they, you took a you took a beating there. Uh, the sell-off uh, a couple weeks ago in gold was amazing. And, 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 and how do we know it's a black swan? I remember they said, this is the biggest gold sell-off in 30 years. Well, what happens is it's my nature, and I assume it's human nature, that when this occurs, okay, uh... Uh, I'm going to answer questions in just a moment, but uh, the, the, with the sell-off, I, I mean, when we hear something like the first time in 30 years, you know, this is the first time in 19 years. I mean, we've gone through a litany of these. So here's some questions I'm having right now. Uh, uh, do I think black swan events are occurring more often nowadays? I don't know if they're occurring more often, but the impact is greater, and I'll explain that just a little later. And, uh, gosh, what are some of the other things? The Boston Marathon bombing, uh, that took place, and that was on Monday. If you remember, the SPX was down 20 at that point. It was a pretty cruddy day. We had a 1.5% move and went down another 1.5% immediately afterwards as uh, people in the markets reacted to it, and we didn't know. We had the uh, the fake Twitter on April 23rd, which said there was a bombing in the White House, and uh, Obama had been injured. The market went down 160 points and up 160 points. I'm sitting there watching. Um, now, that was pretty amazing, and, and I was looking straight at it when I saw it happening. And I'll tell you what I did there. I have a button on my trading platform that says cancel everything, and I canceled everything. And what I had was a couple stop losses sitting in there just to remind me. I put in orders at times above and below the market and well above and well below the market. Okay, where just to let me know where things are trading at times, and so it's it's a shortcut. But the, boy, I, I, one of the most important things for me on any trading platform is to know how to cancel everything, because when the uh, the proverbial fecal matter hits the fan, the last thing I want to be doing is opening new trades. What I do want to do is deal with my current trades, okay? And I know where they are, okay? Definitely know where they are. But, I mean, the fake Twitter, that's a classic black swan. It's unpredictable. 
you know, actually, it's improbable. It's predictable that somebody's going to hack something and come out with bad information. I had that happen to me uh, with, with Amulux. But you sit there and you have this fake Twitter and you go, okay, what do I want to do? The first thing I want to do is nothing. I want to take a deep breath and get centered. Remember, the prepared mind reacts in a reasoned manner, a non-panicked manner. Somebody once described trading to me, and it was, gosh, it was right after I came down, so this was oh, probably late 83, early 84, and it, there was uh, somebody, that, actually, it was before I came down, I was talking to somebody that traded silver and gold when the Hunt brothers were trying to uh, corner the uh, the silver market at the Board of Trade. And if you remember, in 1980, silver went up to, gosh, $50 an ounce or something absurd like that. I didn't trade it. And uh, I asked somebody what trading was like, and he, he described it as uh, long periods of boredom interspersed with moments of panic. Now, it's how we how we panic. <laughs> you know, it w is what is important. And uh, it, as I got to be a better trading, that panic became uh, a focused sense of urgency. And so that's what we hope to achieve. Here's another thing. Loss of access to the SPX and the CBOE, which was the VIX, on April 25th. What do you do? I mean, and, and, and this is an example uh, of a couple things that we could have done. Uh, and, and, and I'll go back through and go look through some of these. Um, without a the, the SPX has some equivalency. If you lose access, the problem with the SPX is it's a single listed product. It's only traded on the CBOE. It's also traded on something called C2, which is the CBOE's uh, electronic exchange. Except about a month ago, and it had been on, the SBX had been on C2. If you hit market depth, you'll notice that it had been there at the beginning of the year, and it was a pilot run, and they closed it down because there wasn't enough volume. But the, the, the volume would have migrated to C2 if they hadn't closed it down. But So the, the SPX, you know, we had no ability to hedge with options. However, if you had enough capital and if you had trading access, there's other ways you could have done it. The SPX, if you remember, is 10 times the size of the spider. Now, here's the gotcha. The SPX and Spider are not, you cannot cross margin them. So if you're long the SPX, you cannot margin your a, a short Spider position against it. But you can come pretty close to a 100% hedge. So you could have bought or sold the Spider underlying, okay? But the Spiders, let's say you're, a thousand uh the spider trades um uh, right now one fifty nine fifty nine it was probably we know it was a bit less, but we'll just say it's one sixty if you're short a thousand share uh a thousand deltas in the uh s p x you have to buy ten thousand deltas in the uh the spider, well, that, that's, you know, $1.6 million. In margin, it's going to be less. But how do you do it? Well, you could trade options and hedge yourself. Now, a basic rule of thumb I use is I generally uh, do not invest more than 70% of my available option trading cash into option strategies. I'm usually 30% in cash, minimum. Uh, I, I think one of the most underrated strategies is to do nothing. So at times, I, I'm even more that like that. Here's an example. When we had the earthquake 
and tsunami a couple of years ago in Japan, I had a position, and I can tell you right now, it was a iron condor, and I was they I was short deltas and short gamma. Now they slammed the market when they announced the uh, the concerns about the uh, meltdown and sold it off very strongly. About a couple hours after that happened, my account read $108,000. Now, I got a call from a couple of you. I can't see the names that are there, but a couple of you people. And it's saying, Frank, I'm losing all this money. What should I do? And I said, do you have to sell? And, or, do you, or, you know, meaning, does, are you going to getting a margin call? Well, since the answer was no, universally no for everybody, the correct response at that point was to do nothing because all of us were still short deltas, meaning that every single dime we were losing was implied volatility. Now, remember, implied volatility or options generally go to zero or parity. Implied volatility is a measurement of the amount of extrinsic uh, value in an options in a strategy in an underlying or the amount of time premium. It gives us an idea there. Well, what happened was every, everybody was after the put premium. So despite it going down, I was still very well off. And a couple of days later, it actually came back. But, you know, a lack of knowledge, a lack of the prepared mind, a lack of understanding what my position was would have cost me uh, some money on that. And uh, so it's really important to know, to continue to educate yourself and, and have an idea of what's going on. So what I do, remember I said, what if, what if, what if. I look at every position and I say, what if, what if, what if. And I, I, I'm a – so – We'll cut, I'll go back, and we'll talk about managing it in, in greater detail. But weather events, I have uh, something at the uh, end of this that goes through it. It's a checklist. It's about seven screens th that talk about what I do on basically a daily, weekly, and monthly basis in order to be able to uh, walk out the door. If my power stopped right now, I could walk out of this house with updated software on a lap, laptop, batteries, a charged cell phone, a charged backup battery. Everything I need is all set, okay? And uh, I, I've already uh, – I have a battery backup, so the first thing I can do is I can backup Option View and be able to be off and running with uh, – option view with an updated position immediately. I also give you guidance how to back up your option view on those screens. Internet service outage, hey, that's the same thing. It's part and parcel of the weather events. Computer and software problems, I'll tell you, I trade, I have two desktops and I have my backup laptop. I'm ready at all times. Software, uh, most places, when I upgrade, I, I back up on a hard uh, external drive. So I generally have, the, I can reinstall a previous version of the software. Um, it's a way around it. Black Monday, you know, that's a function of looking at screens, looking at a risk report and going, what if, what if? What if? What should I do? Um, the Challenger explosion, this is all a function where, and, and the big thing is to assume that, you know, something can and something will happen. And so when I go, what if, you know, what if this trades at 70, what am I going to do? Well, you know, the whole thing is, is buy things for a nickel. I think most of, uh, or even less, uh, it's amazing how I, I cover all my shorts before they hit zero. Another example of that is uh, 
when I traded wheat options at one point, and uh, and I can't think if it was 2005 or so, but we had an expiration. And wheat closed at around three dollars and fifty cents. Might have been 2004. P uh, the people were short the 355s, the 360s, the 365s, the 370s. That's three dollars and seventy-five cents. The three dollar and eighty cents, and the three dollar and eighty-five cents. Now understand, if you get assigned on something, all of a sudden that means that I have to take delivery of 5,000 bushels of wheat. Uh, the, the, a contract is called a car because 5,000 bushels is basically a railroad car. Somebody, and I, I may stand corrected, but I think it was the Australian National Wheat Board, which is a, a cooperative of the, all the wheat growers in Australia, exercised every call. And uh, this is something that will happen in physical commodities. So where do you think wheat was trading on Sunday when all of a sudden Globex reopened? It was trading $4.20 because people were sh – I, I knew, you know, guys that were short, you know, over a million bushels of wheat. I, I, I mean, it's a horror show when these things happen. So, I mean, go through and go, what if, what if, what if? Let me tell you, nobody anymore – they're very careful about letting options expire. Uh, it, it, not buying in short options. I, I, I mean, they're definite. There's no such thing as pin risk because they go so far in both directions uh, to cover those shorts. That's what I learned there. Flooding of the utility tunnels. It's like, how do I find alternate access? Okay. September 11th, 2001, that was, hey, there's nothing, literally nothing I could do. There was no way I could hedge, no way I could hedge overseas. And we had far less uh, computerized access than we do now. The flash crash, those things happen. But what happens is you sit there and, once again, it's a matter of not just it's a matter of managing your risk, covering shorts, okay? Uh, somebody said they didn't know about the loss of access to the uh, SPX on April 25th. It was from the opening until what, probably noon, 1230. It was uh, pretty painful uh, for those of us. Uh, that were, you know, there. Oh, let's see. Oh, by the way, one thing I wanted to me mention, um, and we can go back to the lack of the access on the SPX. Uh, the futures were still trading across the tr street at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, the E-mini. Uh, most of you know it as... Uh, the current symbol is slash ES. Okay, the symbol of the E mini is ES. And the current month is M, which is June, and 3, which is uh, June, or 2013. So if you put in ES M3, it's um, on option view, you put in a dollar sign. It precedes the ES. And. Uh, so you can hedge with uh, the future. That is highly leveraged. It's probably a better hedge at times than uh, the, um, the the SPY. Now the E mini has the is about one fifth the size of the SPX contract, the ES. So the important thing to remember is if you're short. A thousand deltas on the SPX. The E mini has a delta of 200. So it, it's it's confusing. It's one fifth the size. And actually, I would have to double check because I've never hedged an SPX with an E mini. So know 
the contract equivalents of anything. Another thing to keep in mind is Option View allows you to do something called beta weighting. A number of your trading platforms allow you to do beta weighting, but Option Views allows you to do it. So if you had a position in NASDAQ, or let's say Apple, and uh, you know a portfolio with Apple and uh, uh, Qualcomm in there, Apple and Qualcomm are, gosh, I would guess, about a quarter of the value of the, the NDX, the NASDAQ 100 right now. Well, one thing to keep in mind is you can create an equivalency between the NDX and the, uh, the an Apple Qualcomm portfolio. The important thing to remember is it's not a perfect hedge. It's, it's an estimation, but it's better than doing nothing at all. So one thing you may want to look up is beta weighting is something you can do. Okay, this whole 2013 equity rally has been nothing but a, a number of different uh, uh, what would I call it uh, black swans. I mean, we had what 19 out of 21 closing days were higher. Those sort of things. How many times have you heard this is the first time in 19 years? I think they had something like that. Another one was the first time in 29 years. We had two straight weeks without a down tick. I mean, that or without a lower closing day. And then we had loss of the access. Okay. Do we have any questions right now? Oh, somebody wanted to know if there was access to the SPXPM. No, there was not. The problem was with the options exchange was not getting last sale trade from wherever. And uh, and here's the gotcha. <laughs> what happened? Last week, when this occurred, was the options industry conference in Las Vegas. So there was a shortage of decision makers, I would guess, on the floor or uh, in the building. You know, the people that made the, the tough decision. They knew, <coughs> I heard, at 4 or 5 in the morning that they were ha that there was a problem. And uh, it's also my understanding there was a software upgrade that they might have been able to go back to the old upgrade. So the question becomes, you know, did that affect it? It's a black swan. Of course it's going to happen when they're in... Uh, um, Las Vegas. When and you know when the the cat's away, the mice will play. Okay. So here's a question: extrinsic value. Uh, let's see. Option time premium is only okay. Premium the strike price minus the stock. Pr okay. Yes. Uh, intrinsic value is the difference between the strike price and the stock price when both are in the money. It's the real value, the value of, a, of an option price that's directly related to the price of the stock. So if a stock's trading 20, uh, 20 and we have a 10 strike price on a call, the 10 call would have an intrinsic value of 10. Okay, the 21 call with the stock trading 20 has no intrinsic value. It has no value related directly to the price of the stock. Okay, so what if, what if, what if? Managing black swan events. Okay, you, do you want to be proactive or reactive? And I mean, proactive means you take action now to reduce impact later. That is buying short options for nickel. That's updating the software on my laptop. That's, you know, all those different things that allow me to react in a measured, sane way. I mean, for example, you could look at training on options. This training is being proactive management. Reactive 
defines what you do when the black swan event occurs. Now, here's a black swan event that most of us, and I, I've had to teach myself to do, and I didn't include it on the list. Making an error, a, a, a simple thing like a buy versus sell. Um, some of the worst things I have ever seen happen to people on the trading floors are the results of a mistake. And it's not so much the mistake, but it's how they dealt with the mistake that created the chaos. It's sort of like uh, quite often when they talk about uh, crimes in Washington, D.C., it's not the crime that was so bad, it was the cover-up. Well, it's not the, the mistake that's so bad, it's the not dealing with it is the problem. When you have a trading error, cover it immediately. I'm going to repeat this. When you have a trading error, cover it immediately. Okay? This is a reactive thing. It's something that you should know to do without thinking. Don't get cute and try and work it, you know. You may try at the middle, but generally what will happen is, especially on a buy versus sell, uh, things can get bad and get bad quickly. Just get out of the way. Uh, there were some very ugly mistakes that occurred on uh, a week ago Friday with the gold. Or maybe that was two weeks ago. It was just brutal. I mean, think about it. The gold basically went from 1501 to 1325. If you had made a mistake and, let's say, sold instead of bought a... 1425 put and didn't cover it when you saw you had the mistake going, ah, yeah, I can get out of this. I'll work my way out. Rather than taking a loss, you, you quite conceivably could have been put out of business. So the important thing to do, and I forget this at times. I quite frankly forget it. You know, and let's say I do not follow it as strictly as I should. But when I make a mistake, I cover it immediately. You know, it becomes the focus. And so I'm best off taking a loss now rather than a massive loss later. And I've seen too many people take massive losses on mistakes. And um, quite frankly, I, I know of some people that lost hundreds of thousands of dollars on gold on mistakes and things that, you know, if – they had covered it correctly. It would have just been just a really crappy day. But, it, you know, it ended up being more than just that. So that's an important thing to know is when you make a mistake, that's a reactive thing. The proactive part of that is knowing that when this happens, uh, this is what you're going to do. And hence the, uh, the, the, the comparison to an er emergency first responder. I mean um, – What's the first thing you do? I, I, I mean, you look at it, and if you see somebody hemorrhaging blood, you try to stop the loss of blood first. I, I mean, so there's a certain uh, triage. You look at everybody there and see who's the worst off. And so we have to perform triage uh, on our positions, and we have to pre perform triage <laughs> on the individual position. And it's something that I go through every single morning and then throughout the day I'm in front of the tra uh, the uh, the screen all day long every day so I'm looking at these positions again and again and again and it's like what if what if what if uh, trust me I mean I've had to go through some what ifs here uh, with the market up uh, uh, 125 points 15 points on the e-mini you know I've had to do something so uh I have contingency plans, and I have things I do now to deal with problems that may occur in the future. So let's move forward. Gosh, I've rambled on. As I'm, okay, here's basic guidelines for dealing with the potential of a black swan event. And these are things that I've learned. Take care of little things. And big things become less likely, okay? I'll have to fix that. That's 
cover your loss, cover the mistakes, fix the mistakes immediately. You know, if I want to be short something and I end up being long, I'm not in the mindset to fix that anyway because I haven't been thinking for the past hour, two hours, two weeks about how I'm going to trade this from a long position when I want to be short. Cover it. Cover mistakes immediately. Play close to attention to things you can control. Do not waste your time on the uncontrollable. Okay? I can control my position. I can cover shorts. But, you know, I do training exercise uh, with people. Well, I get lectures about how the financial uh, markets are going to collapse. All sorts of calamities. A meteor is going to hit us. Well, you know, there's not much I can do about a meteor hitting us. If I think it's going to be, you know, the end of the world, I might not, you know, meet from a financial um, from a currency standpoint, I might not be long currencies. But, I, I mean, it's not, I can't, there's many things I can't control. And so, I, I mean, that's not where I'm going to spend my time. Okay, here's one. Play close attention to those risks which are scalable. Do not let a $1,000 problem become a $50,000 problem. In other words, if you're sitting with, uh, verticals which have a defined risk and you have another part of the position that's open-ended, take care of the open-ended part of the risk first. Get rid of that. That's triage where you assess the risk and you prioritize it from the greatest risk to the smallest risk and you start with the greatest risk. That's what part of looking at my positions every day and looking at my risk analysis and my risk graphs tell me. That's the first thing I do every day. I'm up at 6.30, and I'm not up at 6.30 because, you know, I'm playing online poker or I <laughs> have faith, you know, uh, you know I, I, I'm farming my farm on Facebook or something like that. No, I'm up because I want to see where my risk is and what I may have to do, okay? When, okay? So... Here's an example. When assessing a black risk, number four, do not accept the first solution. An example of that was we'll go back to uh, the earthquake and tsunami in Japan. And my position that I'm trading goes from 140000 to $110,000 in equity. Well, my first solution is, oh, God, i got to get out of this. I can't lose any more. But I look at it deeper. I understood my position. I understood what the Greeks were telling me. I understood where I made and lost money, according to the Greeks. Remember, we look at these positions based on movement in the price of the underlying, which are delta and gamma. The Greeks are delta and gamma. Movement in the implied volatility, change in implied volatility, which is vega. And move and change in time, which is theta. Well, you know, theta is one of those things which is not necessarily scalable. You know, we can move one day at a time. But on number four, getting out of it was not the right thing to do at that time. And you know, is and I, I can't say all my students, you know, got out of it or didn't get out of it. But the ones who called me, we sat there and I said, this is the situation. This is where we lost the money. We made this much money on delta and gamma because we're short. We lost this much money on implied volatility, and we're at the upper end of it. And, you know, time is time. But we only had like three weeks to go. So the time was working in our favor. And um, we were good from a delta standpoint you know, a, a, another 50, 60 points to the downside. So, you know, I felt pretty good. Ha, ah, here is a question. We go back to somebody that asked me this earlier on. Uh, um, they asked me if it's more prevalent now. Yes, I think it is. Globalization, globalization okay, and technology make black swans more prevalent. 
that is definitely my opinion right now. I mean, 30 years ago when I first started trading, did it really make a difference? What, well, first of all, there was no such thing as the euro. Everybody had their own currency, okay? Uh, you couldn't react real quickly to any market because c computers were not responding to movement. Here's an, the, the Twitter thing on uh, uh, with you know the White House being bombed and Obama being hurt. Thirty years ago, okay. Well, and we, we could use an example when Reagan was shot. I wasn't there, but the markets just halt. You know. The, the circuit breakers were much quicker because everything needed to go through a floor broker on our exchange, on the options exchange, and a floor broker on the New York Stock Exchange. There was no electronic access. The part of the problem with the market going down 160 points on um, uh, with, with the, the the fake Twitter was that computers heard explosion. Obama, Obama, White House, Obama hurt, and computers were doing the selling, you know, and uh, also probably the depth of the bids, the real depth was from computers. So, I, I, I mean, yeah, technology really makes uh, black swans more prevalent, and globalization does now because economies are so intertwined right now. Where you know it's you know you push one side and the other side gets bigger. That's how things are right now. And uh, it, it, I, I think it's far more prevalent. I, I mean, and we have TV people on TV now doing fear casting, and I don't know if there's any other term for it. But, you know, when things were bad, problematic in Europe, you know, the Eurozone crisis. And so I, I, I think that some of this globalization and technology uh, leads to people speaking in hyperbole. You know, the goods are better than they ever were and the bads were worse than they ever were. But, gosh, we used to have to wait until the next day to read the Wall Street Journal to find out what somebody thought had happened and the media on the TV was Wall Street week on Friday nights with Louis Rookheiser you know and uh, we had the, when we had the crash they had a special one on Wednesday night it took them two days to pull themselves together so yeah it, it, globalization and technology make this so much more prevalent and give us gives us all the more impetus to to expect the, the the unexpected you know so that's you know i hope i hope that answers your question about that did it uh do i have a clever uh head here how are dark pools affecting the greeks dark pools do not affect the greeks uh, the Greeks, dark pools may, may affect the volatility, and this would be the statistical volatility, how much a stock goes up or down in a specific period of time. It may, in fact, affect that, okay? But the Greeks are defined by what your position is, what your option position is, and it's a measurement to what your uh, what movement in the price of the underlying, how that may affect the movement in an options position. I really don't know enough about the dark pools. Um, it's sort of one of those things I don't worry about because uh, for somebody like me or somebody else, it's... Uh, something that's uncontrollable and that's basically that on that um, let's see do I have a clever hedge strategy that have more or less zero cost over the longer term no 
it's a basic fact of life that risk and reward are inextricably uh, connected. And so you can buy stuff. Well, there is one thing that if you're very paranoid and you don't want to get rid of an individual asset, you can always collar, which is selling a call and buying a put for basically the same price. Now, it, it, it might not cost you anything, but it, there is risk and reward associated with that position and the underlying. So that's where you own an underlying, and you know, let's say you own gold, and it's oh, I don't know what gold is even right now. It looks like maybe fourteen fifty, fourteen sixty eight. Okay, so you know, I, I might go thirty two dollars out of the money, and I might sell a fifteen hundred call and buy a. Uh, uh, 1435 put for even, and then you know I lose money to the down to 1435, and I make money, but I'm capped there, and I make money up to 1500. I mean, it's one of those strategies. Don't do that if you own gold. Please don't collar it, because it's not that simple. Uh, okay, so I, I, here's another question: uh, What instruments and tactics do you typically hold proactively in ongoing anticipation of a market downturn? Oh, gosh. I don't trade double longs. I don't trade double shorts, triple longs, triple shorts, because I don't understand them. When I say I don't understand them, they truly aren't double or triple, okay? So they don't track. They don't track, meaning they don't uh, trade as advertised in relationship to the underlying. So I mean, there was a an example was a few years back there was a ETF on natural gas that did a really cruddy job of tracking natural gas. But if you trade wanted to track the natural gas prices, all you had to do was uh, be long or short Chesapeake. This does not hold anymore. So um, what option tactics do I use? <clears throat> well, there is a, somebody once said to me, all option strategies work, not all option strategies work all the time. Okay? So uh, it, it's situational. I mean, it, it depends where volatility is. Uh, and, and interestingly enough, here we are. The market's up 120. The E-mini's up 14. The Russell's up uh, seven and a half. And we've had minimal movement in volatility indexes for these uh, stocks. The VIX being uh, the 30-day moving average, basically on the S&P 500 volatility. The RVX being the 30-day moving volatility on that. So, if you'll notice, I, and I'll just tell you, housekeeping. This is about what to do. The, these next few pages here, this is the first thing I want everybody to do. And you do this on a weekly basis. Make sure option view is set up and set up correctly. I don't know what individual trading plans you, or trading platforms you have. Make sure those are set up. I, I mean, a lot of errors come from just sloppiness on our part not having the option view set up correctly, not selecting the right model types and default. Okay? I have included this, and you'll be able to get this online soon because uh, I'll send this to uh, Jim. Okay? Um, but, you know, know your trading platform know where the prices and the Greeks come from. I was talking to somebody who was trading and had been trading for years and didn't realize it on their platform. And it's only because I was looking at his platform and I'm looking, holy cow, you, you, your prices aren't mine. Had been trading for years with a 15-minute delay. Wasn't trading live. Uh, uh, 
information. That boggles the mind. That's why I generally have two things going. If you have Option View and you have another trading platform, make sure that they're running at the same price. If they aren't, that's the first indication uh, that you have a problem. Okay? So know what's going on. I keep my user guide for every platform I trade on my desktop. I can click on it. Now I'm going to go through real quick, and I will skip stuff as we go along. These are the system default models. I use Yates, two Delta Gamma units of a currency. I do not combine the put and call SKUs uh, at w whatever. They are different. Slippage, none. If you have hit bid ask, it's going to assume that any position you have, if you're short it, you're going to have to buy the offer to close it, and if you're long it, you're going to have to hit the bid to take it off. It values your position incorrectly, and that goes with everybody, not just option view. Know what these bids are. If you don't know, ask somebody. Ask your salesman. Ask me. Okay? Get training. Okay? That's a matrix default model. Once again, this is for the individual matrices. Okay? I use large on this because they use all the strikes you display to calculate what the uh, deltas and the Greeks are. Okay, so so remember this, guys. And this is, I can't believe I'm quoting Ron, Ronald, Donald Rumsfeld. There's known knowns. Okay, there are things we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know that there are some things we do not know, and there are also unknown unknowns, the things we don't know, um, which is all perfectly clear, I think. But, you know, inclusion, conclusion, black swans will occur, okay? Make sure you have alternate forms of market access. Make sure you have alternate forms of risk analysis. Understand your position and understand it on a daily basis. Access where you are and what you're doing on a daily basis. Know your response to movements in the price of the underlying and movement in the implied volatility of the options, okay? And have a sense of the effect of a specific event while it's happening upon the price of the underlying, the implied volatility, and the account equity before, during, and after the event, okay? Know what's going on, okay? And then something else I threw in here, let's see, and this will be on the next one. These are my contingency plans, all the things I do. This will be part of the presentation that will be posted. I won't go over it, but feel free to sc scroll through it. This is how you back up Option View so that you can use the software on a laptop, and all your current positions will be in there. Okay? So. Right now, I'll answer any questions that you may or may not have. Um, you're welcome, Rudy. It's good to see you uh, there. Uh, so somebody asked me, what options, strategies do I use? I'm primarily a, a premium seller, but, you know, the, these markets right now have not been kind to premium sellers. One-way markets are very difficult for traders. I tend to be very nimble. Uh, I can also adjust risk with options by going out farther. So rather than trading a front month, I'll trade uh, a, 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 the second month, and that sort of smooths the curve as far as uh, the, the position's reaction to movement of the underlying. Any other questions? I'll give you about 30 seconds before uh, I move on. Okay, well, thank you very much. Oh, here's one. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, I appreciate it. Have a great day. Hey, and when in doubt, call one of us up. If you think your price feed's wrong, 
it, any question you have, don't let things happen to you. Most important thing, that's where you need to be proactive. You know, people will say, well, I thought it was my mistake. Nope. It wasn't your mistake. Just find out what's happening. Information's king. Thank you very much. Good trading.